Hello, everybody. Recording live from somewhere. This is Zach Couples with episode number 157 of the Movement Debrief. And today, folks, you can feel it down in the plumes because we're going to talk about all things pelvic floor. Yes, folks. The pelvic floor is uber important from a biomechanical perspective, especially when it comes to breathing, because it's kind of sort of the base. Your ability to maximize the dynamics in the pelvic floor can influence your movement capabilities ranging from a squat and all other things. You're going to learn a lot about that today, and most importantly, what you're going to do about it. Because your boy, Big Z, has got a bunch of questions that have been asked by the people. They will be answered for the people by this people right here. Fam recognized fam. Without further ado, let's debrief, shall we? The first question comes from Dion. Neon Dion. Here's what Dion asks. Hey, Zach, you should make a video on both sides of the pelvic floor spectrum. Concentric orientation and eccentric. One love. One love to you as well, Dion. Let's do it. Pelvic floor. So you could probably break up the pelvic floor into a bunch of different uh, positions ad nauseum or or, uh, areas. We're going to keep it simple. If you look at the bottom of the pelvis, let me make sure I'm in focus. There we go. The bottom of the pelvis, you got the pelvic outlet, which is this bottom ring, and you can chop it in half. And I would break that chop in half into the anterior and the posterior pelvic floor. I have a really good graphic of this on the show notes, which will be found on zachcouples.com forward slash pelvic dash floor. You definitely want to check it out because I got a full blog. Oh, it's going to be filthy. You're going to love it. So you got anterior and posterior pelvic floor, two sections. And this is useful to break it up into two sections because it's going to give us a better appreciation for understanding the two common moves that are influenced by the pelvic floor, which is motions of the sacroiliac joint, namely nutation and counter-nutation. Let's look into what those two movements involve. So when we're talking about nutation and counter-nutation, we're talking about movement at the SI joint, so the sacroiliac joint. So you got your sacrum, this, this, big, this big bone right here, that's uh, like a triangle shaped, an upside down triangle. And then you got your anominate. That's the other side of the bone. That is the SI joint. Now, folks, I'm going to move this for dramatic effect, but there's only about two millimeters of motion in the SI joint. But that said, that doesn't mean that the muscles of the pelvic floor don't create a pull action on these bones. Just because it doesn't move much does not mean the pelvic floor muscles are not active. Let's now dive into the two moves that happen at your pelvic floor. The first one is going to be nutation of the sacrum. And what sacral nutation is, is the sacrum tips forward like that. And when the sacrum tips forward, the anominates, your big pelvic bones, those are going to rotate posteriorly. So you got sacrum forward, Anominate rotating posteriorly, the combination of those two bones moving is equivalent to sacral nutation. If we look at this from a pelvic floor perspective, if I tip the sacrum forward, now you're looking at the bottom of the pelvic floor, you can see that the coccyx moves away from the middle. The coccyx is your little tail right there. If the coccyx moves away from the middle, that means that muscles on the pelvic floor from the posterior aspect, so middle back, have to stretch or elongate or eccentrically orient or contract to be able to make that happen. So when I nutate the sacrum, the posterior pelvic floor has to become eccentric. Now, subsequently, I can't have something be eccentric unless I have an anchor somewhere to make things concentric because this is how movement works. Just like, oh, you know I was going to do it at some point, fam. When I flex my bicep, pow! Just go ahead and admire it for a minute. In order for me to bend my elbow, just like I'm doing right here, I have to have a concentric contraction of the biceps, but then the triceps also have to provide an eccentric contraction. If that can't happen, then my elbow can't bend. And 
When you see biceps this big, you know damn well that your boy's elbow can bend. So too is true with the pelvic floor. If I'm nutating the sacrum, the posterior aspect has to eccentrically elongate or orient. We know this. But on the front side of the pelvic floor, that's going to be my biceps. That's going to be my anchor. So the anterior aspect of the pelvic floor has to concentrically contract in order for the sacrum to do what it do, which is nutate in this case. So if you see a sacrum that's nutating, which is very common with moves that posteriorly displace the pelvis, such as hinges, among other things, you know that the posterior pelvic floor is going to be eccentric and the anterior pelvic floor is going to be concentric. Now, that's only one movement that happens at the SI joint, folks. The other is counter nutation. Nate Doggy Warren G had to counter nutate. Counter nutation involves sacrum tipping backwards. Boom. The anominates are going to rotate anteriorly like that. And the combination of those two things tips the entire pelvis relatively backwards. This is counter nutation. Sacrum tips back, anominates rotate forward. Now let's look at this from a pelvic floor perspective. If I look from the bottom up at the pelvic floor, when I counter the sacrum, the sacrum tips back, but the coccyx comes forward, meaning it's going to get closer to the middle. Well, in order for that to happen, big fam, you got to be able to create a concentric contraction of the posterior pelvic floor. That's going to pull the coccyx forward. But just like my biceps story before, if I were to reverse that action, which... I don't know why I would, because who cares about big triceps when you got guns like this? But if I were to extend my elbow, the triceps have to concentrically contract and the biceps have to eccentrically contract. So what that looks like from a pelvic floor perspective, when I counter the sacrum, the posterior pelvic floor has to concentrically contract and then the anterior pelvic floor has to eccentrically contract. And that's what happens from a contractile perspective when it comes to pelvic floor dynamics in relation to the movements of the sacrum. Now, our wonderful fam Dion wanted to talk about orientations in regards to the pelvic floor. So let's talk about that. All an orientation means is I have a resting bias towards a certain tissue length. For, for lack of a, of a better uh, explanation. So what I mean by that is if let's suppose I was someone who had an inability to fully extend my elbow because of I mean these huge guns, right? If I couldn't fully extend my elbow just passively, like you, you come, you hang out with me, you shake my hand and you test my passive elbow motion, which if you meet me in person, I expect you to do that. If that's the case and I don't have full elbow extension, that means at rest, my biceps have a little bit more concentric tension in them or orientation. They're oriented more towards a concentric state. My triceps in this case, if I had full elbow flexion, would likely have more of an eccentric orientation. So you could have a situation if someone has an easier time creating, let's say, nutation of the sacrum, where the sacrum tips forward and we have that situation where the posterior pelvic floor is what? Eccentric. And then the anterior pelvic floor is concentric. You could conceivably have someone who has a little bit of a resting bias in their pelvic floor where they generally have a little bit more concentric orientation or they have more tension anteriorly and then less tension posteriorly. And you could have the same thing in, in counter mutation. That's all orientation is, is it's your resting bias. Now, if you've been following me for a hot minute, you know that we break things up to, to make our life simpler into different structural archetypes because folks, people are built differently. And if people are built differently, we're going to be moving differently. And the two archetypes that we're going to break people up into will be based on the infrasternal angle. For those of you who don't know what the infrasternal angle is, 
Well, we'll bring my, my dear friend Freddie Ribs up front and center. Kudos to Mike Koval for uh, giving that name. And uh, yeah, you know, a lot of the fam gave um, some amazing name choices, but um, if you know hip hop and you know how near and dear to my heart hip hop is, you'll understand why we chose Freddie Ribs. But the infrasternal angle is this portion of the rib cage. So if you got the sternum right here, which is the hard part, and you go the xiphoid process, which is the rubbery portion, you're looking at this inner angle right here on the rib cage. That's the infrasternal angle. Infra is below sterno, sternal. But to simplify things, just about everybody is broken up into two different basic structures. You either have someone who has a wider infrasternal angle, which are cut off mark, and I'm, I'm basing this off of um, some of the classic texts from Shirley Sarman. There was a study then that's kind of what they use as the cut off mark, so it, it just kind of makes sense in that, on that front. But if someone has a, 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 an infrasternal angle that's greater than 90 degrees or the angle is more obtuse, like uh, Freddie here, you can see he's, he's a little bit on the wider side, uh, that person's going to move differently than someone who's got a narrower infrasternal angle, which the angle would be less than 90 degrees. So it, the angle would be more vertical in that sense. Based on those two archetypes then, we know that if I have a certain bias at the rib cage, just based on the way the bones are built, that's going to influence how our thoracic diaphragm, which attaches right at the rib cage, is going to be contracting or, or the tension that's going to be in, in the diaphragm, just feeling like Bob Dylan. If someone has a narrower rib cage, the anterior portion of the diaphragm, thoracic diaphragm that is, is going to be more eccentric because that's an exhaled rib cage position because when your lower rib cage moves when you breathe in the diaphragm concentrically contracts to push the viscera down and allow you to fill your lungs with air when the infrasternal angle narrows the diaphragm ascends and that allows you to evacuate air so if someone has a narrow infrasternal angle they're going to be better at getting air out in the anterior portion of the diaphragm and therefore the anterior portion of the diaphragm is going to be eccentric. The posterior, subsequently, is going to be concentric. So there's going to be a difference front to back in terms of how the diaphragm descends. And folks, that's going to influence how the viscera moves down. So what's going to happen in this case is for a narrow, for example, if I'm better at pushing down my diaphragm posteriorly, well, then we know that the posterior portion of the viscera is also going to be pushed more down. And my pelvic floor and my pelvis has to accommodate that downwardly displaced viscera. The position that's going to help that happen is going to be counter-nutation of the sacrum because, uh-oh, I don't want the viscera to fall out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrically contract the posterior pelvic floor. That's going to prevent things from falling backwards. Then, folks, also, too, because the anterior aspect of the pelvic floor is going to descend down, it's going to allow me to better catch the viscera as I breathe in. So, someone who has a narrow infrasternal angle is going to have a more counter-nutated sacrum. And the horrendously convenient thing about this is the pelvic floor contractile bias or orientation for a narrow concentric back, eccentric front, is going to mimic what happens upstairs in the thoracic diaphragm. They're also at the thoracic diaphragm, more concentric back, eccentric front. You can imagine then that for a wide infrasternal angle, it's going to be the exact opposite. So if someone who's wider, they're going to have a thoracic diaphragm that's more concentric in the front and eccentric in the back. That's going to modify how the viscera is pushed down. So you're going to have more front aspect of the, of the viscera being pushed down. So pelvis has to accommodate for that. In that case, I'm going to mirror what happens at the pelvic floor. I'm going to have a more nutated sacral position. And that's going to lead to, in this case, the posterior pelvic floor is going to be more eccentric and the anterior pelvic floor is going to be more concentric. Therefore, to summarize and go over everything one mo again, a narrow ISA 
has a bias towards having a more counter-nutated sacrum, which is associated with a concentric posterior pelvic floor and an eccentric anterior pelvic floor. A wide infrasternal angle is going to have more of a nutated sacrum, which is going to be associated with a more eccentric posterior pelvic floor and a concentric anterior pelvic floor. And that has to do with just the structural bias. And you can have these things happen where one portion of the pelvic floor is concentric and the other is eccentric to allow for certain movements of the sacroiliac joint or the way the pelvic floor pulls on the sacrum to occur. And that is needed for lots of different movements that you're gonna do with your body. Ranging from hinging, which is more of a nutational biased exercise versus squatting, which keeps the pelvis vertical. And if you're gonna keep your pelvis vertical, you probably should counter nutate your sacrum. Awesome question, Dion. Now, if you're wondering, Zach, that was pretty cool. And you, you kind of touched a little bit on squatting and deadlifting. Well, how do I coach my Supreme clientele effectively so they can squat and deadlift like rock stars? Well, we can talk about it all we want, but what's even better is to work on how to be able to do that in person. And there's a place that you can do that. And the place is called Human Matrix, my seminar. And folks, the reason why I'm announcing it to you if you're tuning in is if you are in the New York City area, in particular, Wyckoff, New Jersey, the early bird for that seminar, and it is almost sold out, I think we only have like three spots remaining, is um, ending on Sunday, August 22nd, at 11.55 p.m. in a specific time, so do the math. It's on September 25th and 26th. Uh, like I said, we only have a few spots left, so you'll definitely wanna sign up for that. Also, folks, um, October 23rd and 24th, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We have enough people to make that a go, so sign up for that. In terms of the remaining ones, we got three more this year, November 6th and 7th in Charlotte, North Carolina, November 20th and 21st in Colorado Springs, Colorado, and we're bringing it home to Vegas December 4th and 5th, so I hope to see you there. It's going to be off the heezy for sheezy. Check it out. It'll be in the show notes, which will be found on zackcouples.com forward slash pelvic dash floor. The next question comes from Prashant. And here's what Prashant asks. Can you please define what is the anterior and posterior pelvic outlets and their role in incontinence and how we should approach them? Why, yes, I can. The outlet is the bottom ring of the pelvis. So if you're looking at the pelvis from the bottom up, so you got pelvis in the front, you're gonna tip it upside down. You're gonna draw a line that, or a circle that basically outlines the bottom of the sacrum and the bottom of the anominates. And that folks is the pelvic outlet. What's filling in the pelvic outlet is your pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor stuff that we talked about in the previous question, check it out in the show notes if you didn't, if you missed it. but. Um, that area is what fills in the outlet, is the pelvic floor. And we're going to break up the outlet very similarly to what we did with the pelvic floor. There's two aspects. You got the anterior portion and the posterior portion of the pelvic outlet. And now if we look at this in relation to um, incontinence, or namely if you're going to the bathroom, well, the location of your two sphincters that will control your, whether you're, you're defecating or taking a whiz, is, whiz is, damn, rhyme, bars. The anterior portion of the pelvic floor is going to house the orifice that deals with the bladder. And then the posterior pelvic floor is going to deal with your rectum and your anal sphincter. So um, you got that going on in the outlets. So anterior is going to be more associated with number one. Posterior is going to be more associated with number two. Now, I'm just a silly PT on the internet. I have to say, if you are dealing with incontinence, meaning you can't control your bladder and your bowels for whatever reason, first things first, get it checked out by a professional because there can be some bad things going on that could be contributing to that. There might not be, but there could be. And so you wanna make sure that you rule that out. For example, 
There is a thing called cauda equina syndrome where there is compression of some of the spinal cord tissues and that can influence bowel and bladder control. You need to get that checked out. There could be other stuff going on within the genitals, like check it out. Let's suppose that you got it checked out and you're like, Phew, things are hunky dory. What can I do from a movement perspective to influence my incontinence? Now, I think you could potentially have incontinence a couple different ways because really it circles back to the previous question. And that is, in theory, I could have a situation where I have a loss of dynamics of the pelvic floor and it could be because it's too concentric, meaning I can't get it to let go, or it's too eccentric, I can't create contraction, I can't hold things in. And both of those could lead to problems of incontinence for various reasons. And basically, what would happen if you're letting go of your bowel and your bladder is think about this, folks. If I have a ton of intra-abdominal pressure going on that my body cannot handle because perhaps I have an inability to maximize the dynamics of the pelvic floor, and that's just one component, in order to relieve pressure, incontinence is actually a useful strategy. I think that this is probably one reason why if um, you've ever worked with someone who's worked out really hard and they end up going to the bathroom or leaking when they're doing something like kettlebell swings, that could be why. They create so much pressure in the pelvic floor in the abdomen region that in order to release some of the pressure because they cannot handle it, they leak. Simple way to relieve pressure but not very useful way to relieve pressure because ideally we want to be able to maximize the dynamics of what's going on in the pelvic floor. How would you do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. From a movement perspective, the best way we can maximize pelvic floor dynamics, namely restoring nutation and counter-nutation of the sacrum, is through breathing because when you take a breath of air in and a breath of air out, the viscera has to move downward and it has to move upward and your sacral positioning is going to be influenced by that. So coaching the stack, making sure you can get the tuck, going through the full breathing sequence. Don't worry, it's going to be in the show notes, fam. Check it out. That's going to be a good starting point for a lot of individuals who have incontinence issues. If you can do that, one, and then two, you can get someone to go through a full depth squat because when I go through a squat, folks, I have to be able to counter-nutate and nutate the sacrum at various aspects of the range. High and low, I have to be able to counter-nutate. When I um, hit the mid-range, I gotta be able to nutate the sacrum. All of that, if you can get someone to get to a full depth squat, they're gonna be pretty dynamic in the pelvic floor. And that could potentially have a positive effect on incontinence. I'll have a, a post in the show notes that's gonna drive, dive into that. And if you do those two things, on the movement side of things, that could potentially have some profound impact on incontinence. Now, I would be remiss, folks, to say that if you just do those two things, things are going to be hunky-dory. It may be useful and is probably worthwhile because I'm looking at things from my bias lens to how can we influence movement from a global perspective to increase someone's capability to move better and that can have a profound uh, systemic effect on symptoms. But it totally could be a possibility that you could have a local issue that is the rate limiting step. And that's where working with someone who specializes in pelvic floor stuff could be really useful. Maybe you're someone who needs internal work to be able to maximize the dynamics of the pelvic floor. Perhaps there's other certain things that a pelvic floor specialist could do that your boy can't. And that would be really worthwhile to pursue. Personally, what I found is if I have someone who comes to me with some pelvic floor issues and we hit a plateau, a lot of times going that route seems to clean up most things. Conversely, I've also worked with some people who've had pelvic floor issues, issues of incontinence, and they've worked with a pelvic floor specialist, and they got some good benefits, but they hit a plateau. And then when they came to me, they finished the job. I think in order for, for these folks, and it's going to be a case-by-case -case basis, but if you can blend the two disciplines, and they're very seamless in that sense, 
But if you can do local work as well as systemic work, that's going to give you the best of both worlds and the most likely um, way to achieve success. And if you do that, chances are you could get some substantial improvements in your incontinence, barring any major medical issues. So just to recap, on the movement side of things, aside from making sure you get everything medically checked out and that you get uh, checked with a pelvic floor specialist, incontinence could be contributed to having issues with dynamics of the outlet because your bowel and bladder is located down in that region and, and your ability to control them with the, the, the various sphincters that make you hold in your bowel and your bladder are there. So if you have poor dynamics there, that could influence incontinence. On my side, from the movement perspective, the key would be getting the stack because that's going to help restore dynamics of the pelvic floor and progress the squat. And if you do that, no one's going to mess with you. Awesome question, Prashant. The last question scheduled before I get to you fine Instagram folks comes from Edge Artar. And here's what Edge Artar. Asks. I hopefully I pronounced your name right. I probably didn't, so please correct me. Hey, Zach, do you have any tips on treating pelvic floor dysfunction? I'm a narrow infrasternal angle with secondary compensations, meaning that this person is limited in all directions of movement. Doing the best I can to restore movement options. Anything more I can do to help this? Well, preface, it's going to be hard to say without an evaluation or what is meant by pelvic floor dysfunction. It could be some of the symptoms that we've talked about. So if you know, you're having incontinence or you're having any issues down there, please go get checked out. Um, but let's just say for the sake of argument, we've done that. We've ruled out the bad stuff. We've done a referral to a pelvic floor specialist. And hey, you got someone who's narrow, who is limited everywhere. What the heck do we do about it? Um, I think this is a good time to touch on, touch on my current thought process when working with someone who's limited in all directions because this could influence pelvic floor. And there's some steps that I'm taking now and I'm seeing um, some, some really good results with, with people who are, are limited in many directions or they're, they're stiff everywhere, um, getting, getting some nice improvements. And that could be what's going on with edge artar as well. So let's, let's talk about that. Now, you uh, know that your boy is kind of uh, big on that whole breathing thing because when you breathe, it allows for movements to be restored in the pelvis, thorax, a lot of different things. And, and basically, if we can restore the available range of motion, that means that I have what's called relative motion between all the respective bones. For example, so I got my femur here. And I got the, uh, the sacrum. So if I'm someone who's got all of my movement available, what will happen is I should be able to move my uh, SI joint and my spine throughout the available motion that it should have. And I also should be able to move my femur in all directions. But let's say that for some reason, I've lost range of motion somewhere but I still ask myself to be able to perform a motion throughout a given range. Well, let's say, let's say for example, I lack hip extension, but then I put myself in a position that requires hip extension. If I've lost my hip extension range of motion, I can compensate around that by simply tipping the pelvis forward into an anterior tilt. And that's going to put my femur into a position of hip extension, but I've done so at the expense of losing the full relative motion between the femur and the pelvis. So when there's a loss of relative motion between the femur and the pelvis, it locks into place and moves as a unit. And when you see someone who has a loss of movement in a given joint, but you still gotta ask them to move throughout space, that's generally how they do it. And so we want, what we want to do if we're talking about improving someone's movement capabilities is to be able to teach them to move these pieces independently, meaning they should be able to extend their hip as far as possible and then do whatever they want to do at the pelvis independently. 
And when you can't do that, you're going to lock things in place and move things as one unit. If you have someone who is limited in all directions when they move, they're like that to the nth degree. And so what we have to do for these supreme clientele is we have to be able to teach them to move their body parts independently. And generally, if you got someone who's limited in all directions, they're going to move with a ton of tension. They're going to be really toy like a toy gun and, and move really rigidly. They're not going to be fluid. Problems will ensue. So we want to try and do things to, to mitigate that. And the first thing that I've been doing with a lot of my peeps is teaching them to move with a whole lot less tension. And you might have seen some rolls on my website, and it's definitely on the stacking starter kit, which, uh, you know, if you're new to this stuff and you're like, Z, where in the heck do I start with improving my movement? Just go to the starter kit. Trust me, it will help you quite a bit. But um, teaching people to move slowly, methodically, easily, and effortlessly with less tension is a great starting point if you have someone who's limited in all directions. And there's a couple roles now that I've been using a lot more with my Supreme clientele that I found really useful. And it's literally, you just get a foam roller, you have people lie on their side, and you put them in an external rotation biased range, which would be the lower portions of hip and shoulder flexion. But basically what you do with that is you just have people just slowly roll forward and backwards along these foam rollers. It's really slow. You're having them nasal breathe throughout, and they're trying to move as lazily and as with little tension as possible. If you got someone who's super stiff, awesome starting point. Once you've done that, you can then progress to more challenging roles where you're moving the entire body, but you're still trying to do it with body parts independent. So you're not like doing a log roll with these particular moves. You're, you know, if we're doing an upper body roll, par example, you're gonna roll with your arm and then you're gonna turn your head and then your upper back's gonna go and then your lower back's gonna go and then your legs, so on and so forth. Teach yourself to move with as little tension as possible first because that helps set the stage to restoring relative motion if you're limited in all directions. Once you've done that, then you can start to work on the stack. If you don't know what the stack is, Again, I got a link in the show notes, zackcouples.com forward slash pelvic dash floor. But basically what we're going to do is we're going to teach our supreme clientele to put the pelvis, the pelvic floor, and the thoracic diaphragm atop one another. Because with these folks who are limited in all directions, they're tensing everything front side and back side, but then they're also pushing their center of mass forward. The stack helps teach our peeps to bring their center of mass back and then to work on larger breathing excursions to try to restore these relative motions in the pelvis and in the thorax. So you wanna start with that, make sure they can tuck like a rock star, uh, making sure they can get through full exhalation, still not creating a lot of tension at this point. For these peeps, doing things offset where like if, let's say you use hook lying as a way to teach the stack if you put left foot back right foot forward that can make it a little easier because when you offset the body that's going to induce a little bit of rotation into the mix and that rotation helps create a gradient for them to move through because when i'm locking everything in place i tend to move things as one unit when I rotate something, I have to be able to create space or expand or eccentrically position a certain aspect of the body, and then the other aspect is going to have more of a concentric position. So anytime you can pre-position rotation, that can make things much easier for you and your supreme clientele. Once you've done that, the song and dance is very similar to what we've talked about with some of this other pelvic floor stuff. Progressing the squat is probably the next step that you want to get for these peeps in particular who are limited in all directions. Same rules apply as with the stack. If you got someone who's limited in all directions, I would strongly encourage you to make the squat progression that you use offset, meaning you're going to have one foot back and the other foot forward. Considering 
that we are asymmetrical creatures. And if you got a heart on your left side and a liver on your right, last I checked, you're going to have more of a right-sided bias. I mean, this is found in the literature. If you look at uh, a couple studies done in spine 06, 07, they determined that the normal spine has a rightward rotation throughout most of it. So we probably want to do things to try to counteract that. So for most of these progressions, I have left foot back, I have right foot forward. Start with a higher depth squat, progress to a mid-depth squat, like a sink squat in the offset position, and then you can do a offset goblet squat, making sure you go through the full range. And then I like to finish with a little bit of sauce when I'm taking someone through this squat progression, utilizing things like cheek cleans where you're moving really quickly, but you're going through the full range can be immensely useful to helping your Supreme clientele restore their movement dynamics. And if you do that, ooh, you're gonna be a lot more loosey-goosey you're gonna have less tension and you'll probably have some improvements in some of the pelvic floor issues that you are mentioning. To summarize this unbelievable question by Edge Artar. The keys that you gotta do when you're someone who's limited in many directions, and you got some pelvic floor issues, you gotta move with less tension first, slow methodical rolls, work really well, emphasize nasal breathing, the next thing is teach the stack. Why else would you talk to Zach? Teach the stack, making sure they can bring their center of mass posteriorly. And then the last thing would be progress through a squat. With stacking and with squatting, if you can do things in an offset position, it's gonna make your life so much easier. So I would strongly encourage you to do that because the offset position is gonna induce a little bit of rotation. You get a little bit of rotation in the mix and no one's gonna mess with you. Awesome question. Michaela. That's a good question. How would you go about fixing, and thank you for using that in scare quotes because we're not broken, a right posterior pelvic floor that is constantly tight in an asymmetric position? So what Michaela is talking about is you have some type of concentric bias on the right posterior pelvic floor. This will oftentimes be associated with, with narrow ISAs, this would be indicated by a loss of internal rotation on the right side. So if I have a loss of internal rotation on the right side, it would behoove you to improve your ability to drive some type of internal rotation on that side. Um, if you got someone who has a uh, loss of IR on the outlet on the, the posterior aspect, a lot of times what I've found, aside from coaching the stack, driving a little bit of a deduction to potentially open that up, and working on the squat because the squat is going to at least create some type of eccentric orientation, especially in the mid-range. If you can get someone to turn to the left in, uh, in, in mid-depth ranges, so you're looking at some hip-shifting-based activities, offset sink squat, both of those have seemed to be pretty useful at opening that up. So that would likely be where I would start. General rule of thumb is you want to get them to be able to turn to the left. And in, in the situation where it's more right posterior as opposed to like a left posterior, you want to just teach them to be able to turn left. Two moves that I'll use will be like an offset sink squat, and then also just your classic sideline hip shift or, or adductor pullback are, are really good starting points for those. So that's what I would look into, Michaela. Good question. Big Mish Movement. Do you believe in contracting the pelvic floor for big lifts? Well, hey, I mean, if you wanted to do butt lifts, you could totally contract the pelvic floor there as well, especially after a, a rousing um, dinner at Chipotle. But... Do I contract the pelvic floor for big lifts? Um, so I, this is something I've been thinking about a lot recently. When, when you're doing something that is really high performance, so sport, or even when you're lifting big weights, you, you don't want to think much um, when the goal is force production and output. Because as soon as you get in your head and you're focusing on more internal based things, chances are that you're not going to, you're going to have a sacrifice on, on the performance side of things. 
because when we move quickly or we're, we're, we got to produce a ton of, of, of force output, um, you don't want to think. And in fact, your, 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 you know, your brain diverts cognitive resources to different areas. That's why, like, if you work really hard at something and you're fatigued, you're generally not going to be able to do well with um, more cognitive biased tasks. So I don't really think about contracting the pelvic floor really hard when we're talking about a big lift. If, and, and I'm just going to assume you're talking about pursuing uh, maximal lifts and things like that, the, the big things that I focus on with most people is stack first, make sure you can get a full exhale, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna keep that, that a little bit of ab tension, inhale into that ab tension, hold your breath, rip out the weight, and if you do that, that's probably going to be enough. Um, but I, I, I think, it, you know, if you did that, because the, the Valsalva maneuver is going to be the big rate limiter or the, the big performance enhancer, I should say, in this case, um, you probably don't need to necessarily work so much on the, uh, the pelvic floor contraction. So hopefully that helps clarify your question, big, uh, big mish underscore movement. I think that's a good stopping point for us today. Thank you for tuning in. I really appreciate all your questions. Hopefully you found some of this content on the pelvic floor useful. If you want to learn more, the show notes, I'm going to have a full blog. You're going to have access to the HD and 4K version, the podcast version of this that's cleaned up. Um, it's, you're going to have graphics in it, so I would strongly encourage you to check it out, zachcouples.com forward slash pelvic dash floor. Also, again, I will mention it. If you found this useful and you want to take your coaching to the next level, Human Matrix is happening. The early bird, again, for Wyckoff, New Jersey, September 25th and 26th, ends this Sunday. This Sunday at 11.55 p.m., and I think I only got like three spots left, so sign up for that. It'll be in the show notes. I also got a course October 23rd and 24th in Philly, November 6th and 7th in Charlotte, November 20th and 21st, Colorado Springs, and December 4th and 5th in Las Vegas, Nevada. Please check that out. Would love to see you there. Would love to meet you in person and teach you, and let's see if we can all get our Supreme Clientele's movement better. Thank you so much for tuning in. You've been a beautiful, sexy outstanding audience. I hope that you keep it real, but not to the extent where things go wrong. Stay hungry, stay learning, stay moving, and I'll see you next time. Deuces.